Thank you very much, Ahmed. And it is a pleasure to participate in this event during the Commission for Social Development, especially because it reminds me of so many times we have been here during these years, uh, making progress through to 2030 and to the 30th anniversary of the International Day of the Family also. So I'm very grateful for this invitation. I also want to recognize the presence here of Sheikh Al Mahal Thani from the permanent representation of the state of Qatar to the UN, of Renata Kaspaska, focal point on the family, of UN Tessa, Sharif Noaman Al Mahdi, executive director of DIFI, and, and also Daisy Krusta, president of the World Family Organization, and Juan Antonio Lopez Valjar. Director General of the Instituto de Análisis de Política Familiar. I am very happy, but at the same time, I think we should recognize that these days are a bit bitter. When we see all those images of rescues in Turkey, and maybe more those we don't see from Syria after the earthquake. Uh, I feel that as every time we rub the mystery of life and death, we have to fight in our minds inside to understand why all those kids, parents and grandparents have to suffer in such a way. But we also get the other side of the coin, we could say, when we see so much compassion, particularly in members of the families, relatives, parents, grandparents. We see once more then families are the closest and more human resource for individuals and societies. And this is exactly what uh, one of the more well-known reports of the Secretary General on the International Year of the Family has repeatedly said. Families provide material and non-material care and support to its members from children to older persons or those suffering from illness, sheltering them from hardship to the maximum possible extent. This topic of today is, we could say, very familiar for me and also very, very close to our next activities. As some of you know, we last year had our first digital conference, Love Talks, with more than 20,000 participants of nearly 50 countries. And we made a survey asking them what they would like to be the next topic for this year. And the vast majority supported work-family balance as the main topic for them. So I think this is significant. I mean, of course, it's not a representative uh, measure but it's 20,000 people from 50 countries, which is really, I think, something big. And also, our next presidential, presidential Congress in Cebu, Philippines, next year will focus on a topic very much related to it, the role of the father in families. So you can see that we are really in all our relations with parents dealing with how they can get more help on this topic. Um, and we, we really feel families deserve this protection. It is very interesting to note that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on Article 16, which is where we always start when we want to talk about family, um, mentions the call for family protection by society and the state. And it is the only place in the declaration where the power of the state is invoked as a protective device. I think that must mean something too. Also, also, if we think about the future of society, we see how important it is that families can develop their role to respect this human right of Article 16 to found a family 
the rest of society and the rest of the world need to acknowledge and respect it because the whole society and the whole world benefits from it. This may sound as a very romantic quote, but I think it's very deep and very significant. Uh, maybe you have read this bestseller book from a former suicidal young boy called Seth Adam Smith, where he wrote that no one falls in love by choice, it is by chance. No one stays in love by chance, it is by work. But no one falls out of love by chance, it is by choice. So we need to support as governments, as employers, as NGOs, this commitment of parents to devote the time and, and effort and money to have children and to educate it. And part of this protection, a very important part of this protection, according to many ILO documents, is ensuring a decent job. You know that decent job is defined by ILO as productive work for women and men in conditions of freedom, equity, security, and human dignity. In general, work is considered decent when it pays a fair income, but also when it guarantees a secure form of employment and safe working conditions. So that the two main components of working time, hours of work, but also working time arrangements, work schedules, are really key factors in the determination of how well parents can balance their paid work with their personal lives, including their family responsibilities and other personal needs, of course. And then I wanted also to mention this very important recent report of ILO on unpaid care. It says that unpaid care work makes a substantial contribution to countries' economies, as well as to individual and society well-being. So I feel that care should never be seen as an obstacle to get a decent job, but more the opposite, more as a need, as an investment that produces great revenues at the personal and the social level. But we can see how nowadays unpaid care work remains mostly invisible and recognized and unaccounted in decision making, as, as the same ILO remarks. According to the last data, women dedicate on average 3.2 times more time than men to unpaid care work. This is exactly four hours and 25 minutes as an average per day against one hour and 23 minutes. Over the course of the year, we could say also this represents two, more than 200, 201 working days for women compared with 63 working days for men. So I also wanted to make a call here to keep in mind target five point four of the SDGs, recognize and value and paid care and domestic work and the promotion of shared responsibility within the household and the family. And this principle of shared responsibility has a lot to do also with the real participation of the father in the distribution of duties. Maybe some of you were present uh, three years ago in an event in which uh, someone from UNICEF was explaining very clearly how the absence of the father in the first thousand days of life it has consequences that last forever in the life of those children. And we are not talking about something that happens sometimes. We know that in many families in South America, in Asia, in Africa, even in subsectors here in, in America, in North America, um, 
there is this phenomenon of the abdication or the absence of the father. One possible way to tackle this can be what we suggest in our Venice Declaration. You know, we have this project uh, for inclusive cities that now includes uh, more than 200 in different continents. Juan Antonio can tell a lot because one-fifth of them are from, from Mexico and he has worked a lot on, on them. And this Venice Declaration that supports the project proposes in one of its ten points to establish a specific programs to recognize the value of unpaid work and care and address the needs of families in vulnerable situations. So you can see that we are doing a lot together with many other NGOs, some of them are represented here today, but also there is a lot that needs to be done and we really want to find this balance. And I will say more. I don't like very much the, the expression work-life balance or work-family balance for three reasons. First, because work is part of life. So when you say work-life, you're, you're including the, uh, life in both terms. But on the other hand, life is more than family. So when you say work-family balance, you're leaving something out of it. But especially balance. Balance, which in, in other languages is uh, equilibre in, in French or conjugation or the different ways to, to say it, but it's always like two opposite things you have to keep limited to survive, so to say it in a very quick way. I would advocate also for the term work, family or, or work integration. We need to integrate uh, work in our lives so that the work we do makes sense in the whole of our lives, so that the work we do makes sense as part of our family. And we can see everywhere how when these two terms are dissociated, it is the family that ends up suffering most of the times. Also, in a nutshell, I think that we can say this topic fits really well into one of the mega trends suggested for the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family, demographic shifts, which is precisely the one we are considering during this year. In this way, to demonstrate the implications of these values, both workism at one extreme and familism and the other one they have been called, leads us to explore really the relationship between work, family, gender, role attitudes, fertility across the, the time, etc. In our job as chairs of the NGO Committee on UNICEF, we have collaborated with this thing that has taught us a lot also, this call to action called redesigning the workplace to be family friendly, what governments and businesses can do. And one of its points says the lack of such policies compromises parents' ability to securely bond with their babies in the first critical years of life. Also, one of the think tanks, you know, we are inspiring in different countries, the Famille Durable in, in France has just published this Barometre Les Français et la Famille last January. And there was something very interesting in there, which is that the young generations show their conviction of needing much stronger support from the state and much more time to the boat, to family and to life. We also know that one of the outcomes of the pandemic has been to realize how important it is to put attention into mental health. In the work we have done with the University of Rotterdam, 
Professor Cron has published uh, the results. And she uh, emphasizes how young people during the pandemic develop more negative feelings. But on the other hand, there was this need to give support to families and to friends. So we can now finish by these two folded sides of life that always brings at one side the suffering, the difficulties, the effort, and at the other side the comfort, the shelter, the, the affection of the family. Let me finish by paying a tribute also here to family science, which will be the, the topic of our event at 115 in conference room five. And thanks very much for all the speakers that are here also now. Um, because this family science that is growing so much in this country is key to understanding all types of families and how family relationships affects us, our families, and the whole of society. We want to really show the progress of this academic dis discipline in contributing also to this work family integration. Our societies need so much in our days. Thank you very much. <laughs>